Welcome, low ego action heroes. This is Debbie Levitt from DeltaCX.com. We're a full service CX and UX uh, agency and consultancy. Check us out. And today, upon request, is a micro lesson. This one will be on UX research, note taking, coding, affinity diagram. Thank you, Aitan, for the pandas. Hello to Kayleen and Shalene and Elijah, uh, to, who are here early. That's always beautiful. Um, so uh, like most of our micro lessons, these were requested. Um, I do not have a um, hugely scripted plan for this. I loaded up a couple of screens, and I'm going to be speaking through my general processes and approaches to these things. That means you might disagree with some of them. Your teacher might have said, do something different. And the way I see it is, if there's anything you like about my style, give it a try. If you don't like send anything about my style, don't give it a try. But this is how I do things, and I'm also going to be showing you how my style has evolved over the years. Things I used to do that I kind of don't do anymore, and, and hopefully that'll um, help you out and give you an idea. Now, this lesson is not going to go over anything. Oh, oh thank you, Kevin. Welcome, Kevin, and hi, Vazia. Um, thank you. Um, and remember, this is always archived in the micro lessons playlist. If you want to see it again, watch party at work, share with buddies, uh, it's out there and ads are turned off for the channel. So it should be an ad free, happy experience. Um, so I'll be showing some of my stuff, but I've got the chat room open, uh, which you'll see above me in a moment. And, um, I'm happy to take any questions or comments. Hi, Ekta. So let me load up the um, browser that I've prepared for today and let me press the button that should load it up on the screen. Okay, um, hopefully you are seeing the tip jar, <laughs> optional, the chat room and my browser. And of course, if you uh, aren't already subscribed, won't you please subscribe and uh, ring the bell so you know when we're live, which at this point is four times a week, uh, almost every day, usually except Thursdays. And um, of course, uh, empathize with the like button, help us out in the algorithm. And uh, we have a free Slack workspace that you can join totally free. Yes, promise. Uh, DeltaCX.link slash join Slack. And of course, the tip jar, which is uh, appreciated but optional. I don't do this for the money, but I'm always uh, grateful when you guys uh, and gals and others subscribe uh, to the channel, which is uh, as little as $3 a month. I like to say, I think this time I'm going to say it pays for my chocolate chips since no matter what diet I'm on, I'm still eating chocolate chips. So, all right, you're seeing my screen looks good. So I wanna start by reminding everybody that on the channel, there is a playlist called Micro Lessons. This will end up here later. We've got 22 videos. It's only been watched 492 times. These are free lessons, y'all. So please spread the word about them. I'm, I'm hoping people will get interested uh, in what we've been teaching. So you can look through those and uh, you can see that in the past we did some fake observational research where I did some note taking uh, during that research. And then we've done um, some other, we did the affinity diagram that went with the fake research and um, some other things. So there's lots of little lessons here. Solomon says, everyone press the like button. You have been commanded. Um, so remember that that is there for you and this one will be added as well. So um, I wanted to start by telling you how I used to do note taking and how that's changed over the years. So if you watched sample observational research session one through six, I did something different for seven and eight, but if you watched one through six, you are watching in um, a interview and observational research I'm doing as kind of a fake version with one of our low ego action heroes who volunteered to be in the show. You might recognize some of the faces or maybe the names, thanks to them. Um, and what I did was I did my old style, which was, and again, this is something every teacher recommends against. So I'm telling you that I have done this and I'm telling you to not do it. You will, if you watch those, you will see that I am typing out almost everything the person is saying. Now, I can only get away with that because I type at the speed of a transcriptionist. And I can multitask enough where I am still hearing and typing and can listen to what they're saying and think of a follow-up question and so on. That's nearly zero of you. So, um, and I've gotten away from it myself. So you will see me doing that. I'm not really doing it anymore, but I'm gonna, I'm, again, I'm gonna show you the evolution of my own note-taking approach. Hi, Sylvia, hi, Zach, how's the new job? Hi, Madalena. So, um, 
so you can see that version, but it was killing my hands, y'all. And so um, I've, uh, and, and we have transcription software now. I, I'm a paid customer of Otter, hashtag not sponsored. So I don't have to write down everything everybody says anymore. But again, I'll show you some of my notes from back in the day. So back in the day when I was paying for Optimal Workshop, hashtag not sponsored, um, uh, yes, I'm still here. This is what it would look like. I would go into Optimal Workshop's reframer tool, and as people said stuff, I would just make notes about what they said, sometimes writing what they said word for word, and sometimes reminding myself to track down a quote they said later by using a, a couple of words that, making sure I wrote down a couple of words word for word the way they said it, so that I could later uh, look through the transcript and look for or cold paint flaking or grammar police and be able to find the quote that at the at least at the time I thought might be worthy of ending up in a report or in a presentation. Now um, Optimal Workshop automatically gives you a, a tag of quote if you just write something in quotes. Otherwise you can create um, tags as you go in Reframer and again this is not a commercial for Reframer because I'll show you how I don't use them anymore. Um, so a couple of funny quotes here, like I said, do you, do you know how to do this? And she joked, no, I've only been doing it 10 years or so. And she felt like she still didn't know what she was doing, which obviously is a great, uh, four horsemen of UX moment. This poor person, she was lovely. So again, I, I put a few words in quotes, uh, but again, you can see my style was to write down nearly everything this person said. And since this was an observational study, a lot of things that this person did. Um, I would typically then take these notes and translate them into um, my affinity diagram. But my affinity diagram would quickly look something like this, especially for um, uh, something where we were meeting 10, 12, 20 or more people. But as you can see, what I would do is I would start with my notes. I would look through my notes and I would look for anything that is important. Now, how do we know what's important? Go back to your research plan. Your research plan is your Bible of what you're doing. Um, the uh, research plan will help you with um, what's your North Star? What was I hoping to learn about? What were the, what, what did the stakeholders goals, uh, what were the stakeholders goals for my research? Were the things they were hoping to learn? What were the things the CX or UX team was hoping to learn? Did we do a task analysis? Did we watch people? So um, I would then take my notes and I would bring them into an affinity diagram. Now, interestingly, when I logged into Op Optimal Workshop today, they said, we're beta testing a new version of the reframer. As when you write notes in the reframer, those notes will become an affinity diagram. And I said, aha. So that's evidently something they're going to be beta testing. It looks like it's not publicly available yet. But if you do like Optimal Workshop's way of doing stuff, then it sounds like it could be um, a cool thing. It would mean you don't need Mural or Miro, at least for that step. But I think that's really neat to have your notes kind of turn right into that. Um, Kayleen says, hmm, maybe I should pay for Optimal Workshop. I struggle with organizing my thoughts into notes and affinity diagrams for my current project. I think I redid my affinity diagram three to four times and I still kept going back to my transcript. Right, and there's technically nothing wrong with that. I, at no point am I going to say that anybody's style or approach or whatever is is bad or wrong. You would have to be doing something pretty disastrous for me to say, ooh, that's wrong. Um, so I've changed a lot in my own style. Uh, but again, when it comes, so we'll talk about affinity diagramming later, but that's what I used to do. I would type almost everything everybody said into Optimal Workshop. I would go back later and read it, pick out the nuggets of gold that I thought related to my research goals, related to what we wanted to know about people, their processes, think task analysis, um, people's tasks, steps, decision making, workflows, tools, workarounds, what am I missing everybody? Uh, blockers, issues, knowledge. Um, and then if I found stuff in, in my notes that didn't matter, I just wouldn't bring it over to the board. So it, she has 570 items in her store. Unimportant. N sounded neat at the time. I wrote it down. Didn't end up being meaningful. So 
That's an example of what I used to do for my note taking. Now, some people tell me, Deb, it's my first time note taking. I don't understand what I'm supposed to do. Now, I'm. Uh, I, it depends on what the person you're taking notes for expects from you. So there should be communication there. Also, I don't believe in throwing people into note taking if they haven't at least studied a bit of CX or UX research before. Because uh, if you try to throw people at note taking, they they might not know what to listen for. If it's observational, they might not know what to look for. So we want there to be some skill and training already at that foundation. We don't just want to take someone just because they can type and bring them into note taking. This is not about being a stenographer. It's about being a mini detective. So we need a little bit more than just someone with typing ability. Um, but again, if you are trying to do note taking for the first time, look back at the research plan, look back at the research goals. What are we hoping to learn about? What are we hoping to hear about? Also, if you are going to use an automatic transcription tool, then you absolutely don't have to write down everything somebody says. We're going to get that stuff later. Um, or if it's being professionally transcribed, we're going to have that stuff later. So do not feel like you have to write down everything someone says. And again, this is my old version. I'll show you later how I changed my style and, and you can see what works for you. Solomon says, I was invited to observe a session recently. I was planning to write everything the participant said until I realized we were going to record the whole thing and the participant agreed to it. Exactly. Especially where you are recording the whole thing. And we can plug that into transcription uh, software or systems, then yeah, you get to watch it again later, either you or you and, and your team or whatever. So when something is being recorded, great point, Solomon, thank you. Um, you do not have to agonize over, oh my gosh, I have to write down everything this person says. Um, I have had a couple of... Um, uh, uh, studies uh, where a few participants said, I'm sorry, I really don't want to be recorded. And I would say, okay, I won't record you, but please note, I am going to be making extra notes about things you said. So I might need a little time to catch up. But for the most part, I didn't because I type at the speed of a transcriptionist. But again, in that case, you do need a note taker because you're not going to get a second chance to capture what that person said. You're not going to get those quotable quotes. So really, not only do you want someone with some research experience, but you want the fastest typist you know. Even if their typing's a little inaccurate, you can fix it later. But because you want to be able to quote people later, you need that real quote. You do not want to give the general gist of the quote or a rephrased version of the quote. You want the quote. So um, if you don't have the fastest typer on the planet at your company, could be a good opportunity to bring in outside people who type at the speed of light. You know, the people like who did the live transcript, uh, live typing at, um, collo uh, not colloquial, uh, uh, concentric, the conference. Kayleen says, I can't imagine not being able to record, especially for observation. Yeah, if it's observation, I really need to, to get that recorded. But there have been a couple of interviews I've done where people were like, I didn't, I don't want this recorded. And I've said, okay, but you're right. For observation, I, I kind of need those videos to watch and rewatch what they did. Shalene says, I sometimes just reply, reply or oh, rely probably on the recording and focus on the questions and the follow-up questions I might have to ask. Exactly. You don't want to be your own notate. You want to focus on what the person is saying and be completely present and uh, staying neutral and thinking about, are they giving me the information I need to meet or exceed my research goals? Or are they talking about something weird or did they misunderstand the question or do I need to dig deeper with a follow-up question? What is the right follow-up question? So again, do not try to be your own note taker. Chang says, I found reviewing the recording takes much more time to distill key points than taking notes in the interviews and reviewing the recording. Again, everybody's got their own style and I'm not saying anybody should copy mine. I'm just going to show you what mine is. So that's what I used to do. And then once I realized, hey, we have recordings, we have transcripts or at least auto-generated transcripts that are maybe 92% accurate. But if I find a good quote, of course, I'll clean up the quote. Then I changed my uh, tactic 
on another study. This is all the notes I wrote down for one person. And mostly I wrote down the things that I saw that I didn't want to forget later that I saw. So I didn't write down any of their interview answers. Those are going to show up in the transcript. Um, I didn't write down any of their post-task interview answers. Those are going to show up in the transcript. That's going to be easy to deal with later um, or copy paste if I like a quote and I've, I've cleaned up the quote. Um, but I just made notes of things that I saw them do that I didn't uh, want to forget that I saw. So that was my entire notes for the session. And I think that was a better way to go. Charlene says, I just hate listening to my own voice when reviewing the recording. Many people do. You just have to get used to it. So I think this is probably a better way for me to go in the future, which is I'm just going to write down um, uh, important things that I saw. Now, another thing that I tried recently, and I didn't open up a screen to show you this, is at my new job, I started by interviewing like half the people who work there to get to know them and get to know what's going on at the company so I can fix it. And for that, I took my notes straight into Miro. So I didn't have Optimal Workshop first. I didn't have um, Google here because I wasn't paying for Optimal Workshop. I was just typing notes into Google Docs. Um, I didn't do any of that first. I opened up Miro and I just started putting up stickies for things they said. And when they switched to new topic, I put them on a new line. And then later on, I uh, adjusted them by theme and pattern. So that's another way that you could do this. You or your note taker could take notes straight into uh, your virtual sticky note board and um, and sort out sort them out later because hey, they're already notes in a sticky note world. Um, uh, let's see. Solomon says, question. When talking to a non-native English speaker, is it appropriate to ask them to repeat themselves? What's your recommendation on how many times we can do this? Um, I guess if you're saying that someone is not a native English speaker and you're having trouble understanding them, uh, I am fairly comfortable saying to the person, uh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't understand you there. Can you please say that again? Or um, did you just say this? I'm not sure. Um, I did interview someone last year who was Spanish from Spain and her English was so-so. Um, I used to speak Spanish, but I've forgotten it and I am learning Italian. And so they're, they're close in spots and different in spots. So there were times where I would double check what she said with it, in Spanish or Italian. And it was close enough that she was like, yes, that's what I mean. And I would just notate in the transcript that I asked her in Italian if this is what she said, or I asked her in half Italian, half Spanish, if this is what she said. And I went back and notated that. So if it happens to be a language that you speak, um, that can help. If you think you are going to have a large um, participant audience whose first language is, is something, sometimes it's good to have a researcher who also speaks that language. Not for the purposes, I mean, sometimes you do want to interview people in their native language, but maybe just to double check um, in that language for, for the person. I try to have people interviewed in the language in which they're going to use our tool, system, or product. If they're going to use it in English, let's talk to them in English. If they're going to use it in Spanish, we should be talking to them in Spanish. So really, it's what language are they going to use it in? Um, Vazia says, same here, I'm cringing. Oh, they're talking about hearing their own voices. Kayleen says, do you feel like it's better to not chase? Better to chase than not. I know sometimes the chase ends up being irrelevant, but it's better than re-watching the recording and thinking, I wish I could talk to them now. Again, I think if you have that research goals as your North Star, then you can ask yourself, do I need to chase this or not? Because I think a common newbie mistake is to chase stuff because it sounded interesting, even if it had nothing to do with what we're trying to research or uh, what our company might build. It's, it's really easy to get um, irrelevant. Again, you can always watch the um, sample uh, observational research I did, especially the one with Joel Barr as our sample guest, which was session six. I asked him to specifically role play a difficult uh, participant. I said, sometimes I want you to give me answers that are too short. And sometimes I want you to give me answers that are too long and people can see how I wrangle you. So if you don't watch any of the other ones, still good to watch that one and see a little bit of, of that. Um, I cannot give you a rule of thumb on 
chasing follow-up questions because it's so, it depends, you know? Um, Chang is saying, I chase if I think it would be useful. Right, me too. If the if I feel like I need more information or sometimes I find people give me a half answer that I feel like the fishing rod has just been cast, you know, I'll say, you know, do you blah, blah, blah. And they'll go, yeah, yeah. Uh, just on uh, for a special occasion. I don't know what's special to them. So to me, that was like, oh, I just I just got caught by the fishing rod. Oh, what kind of special occasions will you do that? Oh, well, you know, then, then they'll tell me. And then I go, aha, this is when this person does this. Um, so I would say, listen for things that are incomplete answers. Sometimes that's when I'm definitely chasing when people give you these weird short answers or answers that only mean something to them. Like, yeah, sometimes I have to do that. Oh, well, can you give me an example of times when you do that? And can you give, and then they answer, can you give me examples of times when you don't do that? Um, Rhythm says, do you think people from a particular culture can be interviewed and understood better by an interviewer of the same culture? Um, I think that there are times where that can make sense. Um, I'm working now with a South African company and they um, had some uh, Indian UX researchers talking to South Africans. And the South Africans were like, why am I talking to someone from India? Like, where's the South Africans? And, and I think sometimes anybody of any culture feels that way. Where's the people like me? me. And I think we're seeing that a lot more in conversations around diversity, equity, and inclusion. You know, why are all of these UX researchers uh, white Americans? Or why don't we have more diverse options? I'll tell you a quick story and then I'll get back to the topic. Um, in some of the research projects I've done in the last year or two where I've uh, partnered with Larry Marine, what I've done is when people got to book time with us, I put up a picture of me and I was like, book with me. And I put up a picture of Larry and I say, book with Larry. And, and then I have a third option, which is book by time and the system will just assign you somebody. And I found that 50% of people, roughly, in two research studies that Larry and I did, 50% of people said book by time and just give me whoever. And 50% of people specifically chose one of us. And that might be because they just have more comfort talking to a man than a woman or a woman than a man. Um, and so we didn't get, we didn't put up our bios or anything. It was really just pick by picture and name. And so I think that if we gave people more options, different ethnicities and other representations, I think that would provide people even more comfort uh, in the setting of uh, research interviews. So thank you for the question, Rhythm. Um, Kayleen says, yes, this special occasion thing is a great example of a half answer, like the outsourced calls. Yes. So, um, so coming back to this, don't forget that these lessons are here for you. And so let's also take a look at, um, so what we've done recently, and I hope Kayleen won't mind me showing, is we earlier this year for two projects at Delta CX, we tried um, Dovetail. Hashtag not sponsored. I paid a lot of money. Definitely not sponsored. Ouch, ouch. Um, and we tried out Dovetail for two projects. And what we did was we took our Zoom video recording. So of course that's video and audio. We loaded them into Dovetail. Dovetail did an automatic transcription. And then Dovetail lets you code and tag that um, based on tags and codes you'd like to create, which again are probably going to be your themes, your patterns, or again, reach back to your research goals. What were we looking to learn about? Those are some great starter tags and starter codes for, for your stuff. Um, Shalene says, how is Dovetail? We recently got that in my company, but I haven't had the chance to use it. So yeah, let me show you a little bit of it. So here are our very good friends, Kayleen and Anita, doing a fantastic job in, uh, in apprentice work with Delta CX and me. And what happens is as you are doing these uh, interviews, um, you, uh, you get your transcript and then you can go in and highlight sentences or clips or whole bits of things and assign them a tag. That's what these colors are for. I think if I hover, it'll tell you. So this is somebody who had formal music lessons. So we tagged that related to formal music lessons. And 
Um, so this is an example of where you are now doing some of that coding and tagging based on the transcript that you got. Dovetail's not unique in this. A lot of their competitors do the same thing. So this is not um, special to Dovetail. It's just one of their features and we did like it. We did not like their commenting feature. So stay away from that. We were also looking for where people had positive online course experiences and negative online course experiences for this study. So that became a tag as well. Um, ultimately, some tags uh, Kayleen and Anita agreed to start out with at the beginning, and some probably uh, grew organically as they were working. But because there were two people on this, it was important for them to have some interaction and some collaboration so that they knew each other was uh, creating tags or expanding uh, areas and things like that. And then once you have all of these things tagged, Dovetail gives you a list of tags and they treat it a little bit like a Kanban board, but we're not moving things through a Kanban board. The idea is that you can then group your tags into larger groups. So, so they ended up with a few tags that had to do with uh, money, things people were paying for, music equipment, courses. Um, we definitely had part of our research was to learn about what motivated or demotivated people in music lessons. So we've got tags relating to that. We wanted to make sure people were familiar with tech when doing online music lessons. So we've got tags relating to that. Um, and you can create all of these tags. You can assign them a color and Dovetail lets you group them. So here we are doing the coding and tagging. Um, Shalene asks, was the recording done on Dovetail? No, I think we used Zoom for this. If Dovetail records, I missed that part. Um, I usually just invite people to Zoom and I record it. And then you upload the Zoom video and Dovetail does the transcript. Again, this is not a commercial for Dovetail. There are a number of competitors right now doing the same thing, and you're welcome to try any of them out. This is not sponsored at all. Hashtag not sponsored. I paid hundreds of dollars for this. Ouch, ouch. Um, and so you end up with these tags that are also then nicely grouped, which I thought was um, really neat. Um, Kayleen says, I felt like the video and transcript syncing together was awesome. I found that dragging the text to make a tag was difficult and buggy. Okay, um, that says maybe. And again, we did not like the... Um, the commenting, yikes, do not do the commenting because we found out later there was no way to export or gather our comments. They were just, you had to go manually find them. Yikes, yikes. Um, okay, so now we can talk, uh, they have a couple of charts that are visualizations that really didn't make sense to me. Like, I don't know how this helps anybody unless you're trying to show like, whoa, a lot of people said things about things things. Um, but this didn't really help me very much. I'm not sure it helped Kayleen or Anita, but if for some reason a visualization of this helps you, then um, you can create a few different uh, visualizations from this. But um, ah, this to me would end up on the blog WTF visualizations, which I think is viz.wtf. So no, thank you. Um, and also the insights part, which we it, sound, it looks like someone played with, my guess would be Kayleen, but the idea was you can create, um, this is where it becomes a research repository. You can take highlights and things you wanna write and media you want to add and you can make pages and that way you can present the research in a searchable place where people can find it later. So that's the research repository part of Dovetail, but we didn't wanted or needed for that. We wanted to get organized with our coding and tagging and, and notes um, for that. And for that, the highlights area was really great for us. The highlights area let us take a look at all the things that at some point got coded and tagged in some ways. Um, Kayleen says, I never got use out of the highlights, charts, or insights. I tried. I definitely use the highlights. And if Kayleen, if you haven't done your video montage yet, you're going to live in the highlights highlights area. One thing we love to give our clients as part of our research reporting and research wrap up are video montages by theme. So let's say that we wanted to create a filter and we wanted to find all the tags that were, um, let's pick something relatively simple. 
music equipment. So people talking about the cost of their music equipment, let's say for some reason we want to create a video montage out of that. So this person had a cheap microphone, we could include that to show that some people haven't really invested in their equipment. I can check that off. Now notice Dovetail now says, are you looking to add this to an insight, add another tag, download a, download a highlight reel, or download some sort of Excel thing, which didn't help me. So now this can also show where some of the coding and tagging went a little funky. My suggestion to people, especially if things might turn into video clips later, is you've got to make sure you have highlighted and tagged enough of the text or the video that it's in context. So this guy said, I would say about 500 pounds, but I don't know what question he's responding to. So it would be better to have said, you know, hear the interviewer say, um, how much have you spent on your home recording studio or your microphone. We really don't know what was asked. Was this, is this what he spent on a guitar, an amp, a studio, a microphone? Um, we don't know. So in that coding and tagging, especially if it's going to, A, for your notes later and your affinity board, and B, for a video montage later, make sure you're getting enough of the context of what is this person answering. Um, so, uh, this person has spent $10,000. Um, let's say we like this one and let's say we like this one. Let's say these are three really great clips that we would love to be able to show our client in a montage. Now we've put together montages with four clips and 20 clips. So it just depends on the, the message you're trying to give to your client or stakeholders or teammates. And then I can say download highlight reel and it will literally cut a video of just boom, boom, boom. There aren't any sexy transitions. You can't edit the video in dovetail, at least that I found, but at least you end up with a neat little video montage. Sometimes I bring it into my video editing software and I give it a little title card like, um, uh, uh, participants spending on music equipment, you know, and then go. Um, Shalene says, so it's like a clipping from a video which mentions particular information. Right. And it's based on the coding and tagging that we did before. So that's why it's important to make sure that we have um, grabbed enough of what they said so that if we watch it later, taken out of context in a vacuum, we understand what people are talking about. So um, that's another thing that I liked about Dovetail and something that would probably, excuse me, make me want to use it again. The filtering was quite um, strong. Not only could we choose multiple tags, but you could be searching the content. Um, let's find uh, every time somebody said epic rock choir. Oh, come on. That woman said she was in the epic rock choir. It didn't show up. Or do I have to look up transcript? Tags, notes, I think it's, I think it sees the note is one of, oh, those notes. Okay. That's different. Okay. I didn't use this very much, but where, wouldn't the content be like a word somebody said, like Marcella? Okay. There we go. So for some reason we knew that there was a concept or person or thing that people mentioned and we want to get we want to see every time people mentioned it, there's that too. Now I used this not only for the video clip montage, but also from, for affinity diagramming. So not on this one where Kayleen and Anita did it, but on the other project in here that I'm not showing you, um, Ralitsa did all of the coding and tagging. She is a saint. She spent like a month on it. She's a genius someone hire her. Um, and, um, then I went in and looked at all of her tags and I would say, just show me this tag. And I would look through what she tagged as important and take anything I agreed with and get it on. Uh, actually, uh, in my case, I went straight into the report, but I could have gone into an affinity diagram first, if that would have helped me gather my thoughts. In my case, I went, I took that stuff straight into the report because to me it was already tagged. So I already had themes and patterns and um, things relating back to the goals. And I could just start organizing it in our report by theme. That's my choice. If you want to do the affinity diagram as a step in between, I, I wouldn't say you shouldn't. Kayleen says, when highlighting in the data tab, the text you drag resets itself every time you drag across the endpoint of a tag. That got painful real fast. You should probably write to them. I would say do a screen capture of you doing that and write to them um, because they should, they should know about that. That sounds buggy, especially if something's buggy, I write to companies. 
and I send them videos of me doing it. Um, so uh, this was something nice that again, now that you have this stuff coded or tagged, you, um, you've pretty much broken it into themes. And again, you can create tags as you go so that if you find that there's a sub theme or, oh gosh, I called that motivation, but I'm really noticing there's intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation. I should have made two tags. So you might have to go back and re-tag some stuff. I am not saying that this is necessarily a shorter process. Us, it might end up feeling quite long, especially if you, you uh, create more tags on the fly and have to go back and re-tag things. Um, however, it will make you extremely, extremely organized. It almost builds the affinity diagram for you because you've put things into themes and groups already. That should also help with the report you're going to write. And then, of course, I also like to do my video montage by theme. Um, Chang says, wow, video montage could be very powerful to show stakeholders. I agree. And, um, that's something I love to give to clients. And usually now this is a different type of research project. This was, um, uh, in general exploratory research to learn about people's history and goals and motivations around learning music, um, through online lessons, uh, rather than through in-person lessons necessarily. The other project that we did with was, uh, a different type where it really was interviews and observational. So it was great to be able to give the client a montage of here's everyone who hates your checkout and why. Here's a montage of, of everybody who liked something about your competitor's website and why. Here's a montage of all the times people hit your website and said they didn't trust you. I mean, this was, I was really excited about it. And of course, that's thanks to Ralitsa for doing great uh, coding and tagging. And a little bit of thanks to me for good interviews and Larry. Um, Aitan says, do we have software rec like this? Tags, highlightings, grouping, affinity diagram, but only for textual data if we don't have a video. Yeah, the video is totally optional. You can load any media into something like Dovetail, or again, you could do this in Otter, because Otter will take a video or an audio and just give you a transcript. You can create a transcript and make your own hashtags if you want, but then it's nice for software like this to kind of crunch it up for you. Um, Chang says, what about Airtable or Notion? I haven't tried those, but I hear people saying good things about them. So again, you know, some people like to do their coding and tagging and note-taking in Excel. I'm not going to tell you not to do that. I'm just saying that now that we've seen Dovetail, even though it had some funky moments, we'd probably use it again. Um, hashtag not sponsored. Um, does Notion do it? I don't know. I haven't tried Notion. You're all going to have to ask each other this. Um, so let's talk a little bit about affinity diagramming. Now, at times I do extremely simple affinity diagrams. If I feel like I've had some very simple research, this was based on a diary study where people sent in some reactions to things that they were trying. And so in, I made really general buckets, positives, negatives, room for improvement and suggestions people made, and then other findings. And I color coded it by which group they came from because we had kind of four different groups. This is super, super uh, uh, basic. This is extremely basic. It certainly looks very different than this affinity diagram where we ended up with a lot, a lot, a lot of different themes. And this was because we were looking at a step-by-step -step process that people did on a website. And every time there was a step and there had to be like 40 steps, I realized we should probably have a separate bucket on the affinity diagram for what happened during that step. What did people succeed with? What did they fail with? What did they think of it? What did they say about it? And just bucket it all together so I could see everything people said about that particular step of the web process. That was a decision we made. If you had broken it up some other way, I can't say that's wrong, but that's an example of how I've done uh, affinity diagram. Um, it very often by either the step of the process, it could be the goal from the research, it could be, um, uh, positives and negatives about different things. Uh, let's see, uh, Zach says, Notion, Coda, and Airtable work well for this. Hashtag not sponsored. Everybody can try them. 
Um, Kayleen says, do you find that the report informs the affinity diagram structure? I would say a little bit uh, more the opposite because I typically do the affinity diagram or, or at least the coding and tagging first. So it's the coding and tagging or the grouping in the affinity diagram, which may be the same thing, or maybe you change your mind as you're going, that informs the structure of my report. So typically the structure of my report will end up following a lot of what I ended up doing in the coding, tagging, and affinity diagramming. So for example, for this, um, the report was all about walking through each step of the process. And what did we hear from people? What were the good things we heard and the bad things we heard? Where was the room for improvement? Where was there for horsemen? Frustration, confusion, disappointment, and distraction. Um, and what are some of our actionable suggestions for making improvements to that particular step? Uh, because again, this was a very long step-by-step -step process and we really wanted to spell out, yes, we did a task analysis, but in the report, we really wanted to spell out in detail what was going on in those steps. We um, sent videos uh, to this client. We, um, we also used a lot of quotes, so we went back into the quotes. For this, we had tried Descript, and we've now tried Descript twice, and both times I have rejoiced at uninstalling it. So, hashtag not sponsored, especially since I just pooped on them. But we did not like Descript, and I'm not sure I would give them a third chance. I don't think Descript is necessarily the right tool for the job. I know that Michelle Ronson recommends, what is it that she recommends everybody? Is it Reduct? I, I don't remember. Also not sponsored. I haven't tried them um, at all. So um, these are some of the techniques that I'm using when I'm doing this stuff. And as I said, most recently, um, I tried uh, note-taking straight into Miro. I've switched from Mural to Miro, also not sponsored. Um, I am paying Miro. So that is uh, another thing that I'm now trying because here I was just typing into uh, Google um, Docs because it's free. And then in the newer one, which I'm not showing, I was typing straight into Miro. And then I went later, I did a duplicate of my board and I made groups and I started moving everything back. So then I would have one Miro board that was just um, uh, organized by the interview so that they were all still together based on who I was talking to. And then one board that took them out of that and put them into um, groupings. Um, Kayleen says, I found it hard to go from affinity diagram to report until I thought of recommendations to make and then supporting the recommendations with the insights. <coughs> Maybe each project will be different. Let's see. Shalene says, if you do neat and clean tagging, let's say using software, do you have to turn it into an affinity diagram? You don't. That's totally optional. Um, I think Kayleen and Anita wanted to try that for theirs, where they took it from, um, from here into, um, into Miro. Um, but that was optional. I hope it helped them. Uh, I'm not sure. And then um, for the other one that we did with Ralitza, um, I decided to skip that. I, I was worried it was just going to take me too long. We had met 27 people. She had what felt like 100 tags. It was a huge amount of stuff. Um, we had like 24 hours of video. So I wanted to kind of say, ah, you know what? I did almost all of these interviews. I get it. She's tagged it. Let's just go straight into the report. And I ended up happy with that. I don't think I would insist on an affinity diagram in between again, but that's mostly because of the level of confidence that I had in her coding, tagging, and note-taking. So I, I'm, you know, I'm very lucky there. Um, Madalina says, I think Miro now has a Zoom integration, if I'm not mistaken. I'm not sure, and I'm not sure what I would do with that. Is it just going to turn everything we say into thingies? Or, yeah. I don't know. I'll just say I don't know. Um, so uh, this has been a bit of a look on how I approach some of the note-taking, 
Uh, some of the coding and tagging, which again, right now we're doing in Dovetail, but Dovetail has lots of competitors. If there's any reason why you don't like it or want to use it, again, there are many people who do this stuff in Excel, uh, in Google Docs. There's a lot of it that could happen in Optimal Workshop. Um, if you're already using a tool that you like or paying for a tool that you like, please use it. This is tool agnostic. We got this work done before there was a dovetail. We got this work done before there was an optimal workshop. Sure, hopefully over time, tools are helping us and making us more efficient, but the tools are optional. You can still do this with, with Word and Excel if you want to. Um, totally up to you, but I do, I do think the world is a better place with these automatic transcriptions, um, which sometimes come out really well and sometimes are a total disaster, usually depending on people's um, accents or, or things like that. Um, Kayleen says, oh, have you decided whether you like Miro or Mural more? Yeah, I have switched to Miro and I am now paying for Miro, hashtag not sponsored, I'm paying them, um, because Ralitsa convinced me and she was very convincing and she helped solve all the things I couldn't figure out in Miro. So and eh, to Miro for there being things that I couldn't figure out to the extent that it made me not want to use them. Hooray for Ralitsa for recognizing where I was struggling and helping me find solutions. So my old boards are still in Mural and my um, newer boards, mostly as of some months ago uh, in 2021, are all in Miro in a paid account. Um, any other thoughts or questions, anything you feel like I didn't cover or anything you're wondering, you're not sure about, um, this is your time. Uh, you've joined us live. Thank you to all the people in YouTube. It's a big turnout today. Um, I'll go back to a big giant face of me. Um, anything else I can tell you, speak to, let's see. Um, Shalian says, sometimes I feel almost all the info shared by the user is important. It gets a bit difficult to filter out what's relevant and what's not. Um, what's the best way to resolve that confusion? Go back to your research goals. What were you hoping to learn? That way you can start to compare the things they said to what they were hope you were hoping to learn. Also ask yourself the usual Deb question. Okay, so I wrote down that she has 550 items in her online store. Is that meaningful? Does it matter? Was that was it part of the study for me to uh, know how many people how many things people had in their store? Uh, did it matter? Did I make a chart later of that? I did not. So um, that was something that I wrote down and then decided later, doesn't matter. doesn't matter how many items they have in their store. Also, in that case, our client had recruited the people for us. They, they could go into their database and see how many things people had in their store. So there you go. Oh, Oz is here and says more Excel. I am not surprised. Um, I10 says, repeating my question. Oh, sorry, I must have missed it. Do you turn codes into different themes later in an affinity diagram or you use the same tags as the codes? Am I being clear? Confused, con concerned face. Uh, okay, I think I get you. Let me try answering it and you could tell me if I am close. Um, so do I turn codes into different themes later in the affinity diagram or do I use the same tags as the codes? I typically start out with the same tags as the codes because the tags were probably the themes and patterns that, um, that I found or that people working with me found. Um, they might be themes and, and patterns related to different groups of people, different steps of a process, different goals of things we were looking for in the research, like when I showed earlier that we really wanted to learn about how people learning music online were motivated. So we have some tags related to motivation. So I would probably go into my affinity diagram first by copying some of those tags. But if as I'm going, I'm noticing that I don't think things were tagged correctly, or I think a tag could really be split into multiple tags because there's a more nuanced pattern or a sub pattern or sub theme there, I would change it as I went. And so I would say you can start with the coding and tagging you've done as a probably pretty good framework for, for your themes and patterns. But as you go, keep that critical thinking hat on and see if uh, anything else emerges because every time you take a pass at this stuff, 
usually something else pops out. Don't be afraid of something else popping out. Don't say, no, no, I have enough tags and themes. Let it go. Be with it. Um, SR, is that Scott? SR says, can you also do a tutorial on quant research and some basic concepts? Quant is not my strength. So I will um, write that down and I will see if we can find a guest um, for that. And um, I, I invited some guests and they all said no because I invited people who work at FANG, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google, and they all said I am not allowed to be on podcasts. So I am trying to find some people we can talk to about quant, uh, whether it's an interview or a micro lesson, kind of doesn't matter, but I'm having a little trouble. So I'm going to try some new people. Um, Chang says, I remember Deb had some sessions re prepared for quant research. Yeah, I've been trying. They turned me down. Um, I10 says, crystal clear. Thank you. Well, good question. I'm glad I finally understood it. And this appears to be, is that a vampire or Dr. Strange? Are we in the multiverse? What is that? Um, any other questions? We've got a few more minutes together. And while you come up with your questions, let me tell you what's coming up on the show because I've got a whole bunch of micro lessons planned this month based on things you've asked me for. Vampire fangs. I got a fang. Okay. Tomorrow is Office Hours Ask Me Anything. It is the second Tuesday, but Nick and Darren rescheduled for next week. So it's just me. Uh, Wednesday is our monthly Slack networking. So if you are part of our Slack group, we will have a link in the live events chat uh, room on Slack that will take you to our live video networking, which is completely free. Just an opportunity for us to meet each other and chat. Um, Friday reaction stream. I already have a million things. Uh, Monday is a micro lesson on screener surveys. I will be showing you how I create screener surveys. Again, my style, take what you can from it. Uh, Tuesday the 17th, double office hours, morning and late, plus Darren and Nick. Let's see, Wednesday the 18th, going to dinner with my boyfriend's friend. Friday the 20th, reaction stream. Monday the 23rd, Michelle Ronson is back. She's going to be talking about moderated and unmoderated research. What are these methods and when do we want to use each one? Delicious. Uh, Tuesday the 24th, office hours. Wednesday the 25th, I'm going to do a micro lesson on how I set up unmoderated research studies. So again, it's how Deb does the things. And remember, if you want to see our schedule of upcoming stuff, you don't have to wait for me to read it out. DeltaCX.link slash events. Just jump over there and it's a cheesy Google calendar of all the stuff that's coming up. If I've scheduled it and it's real, it's in there. Um, also remember you can send in things for the reaction stream. You can send in things for office hours, ask me anything. I do coaching, I do portfolio reviews. I've got a video course on HR training and I keep forgetting to tell everybody to please enter the giveaway. So let's, let's do the drawing at the end of August. Please enter the giveaway only once, and the summer giveaway is I will send you a box of Italian goodies, as in pasta and cookies. Please make sure that your country allows you to receive food from Italy. Please do not make me spend all that money and then find out I can't ship to you. So please enter the giveaway. There is no cost. You can only enter once, and I will pull someone at random in early September. So there's that. Um, let's see, SR says, how have you responded to people that don't get qualitative research in the sense that the sample size is limited? Um, yeah, I mean, the rule of thumb for, uh, qual research is usually eight to 12 people of each target customer segment or group or type or persona. That is the rule of thumb. That's the, that's the sample size. And typically, um, once you are meeting, if you've recruited correctly, once you start talking to a bunch of those people, sometimes even before you're up to eight of them, you're already hearing them say similar things or sometimes the same thing. Um, so that would mean if we're already finding patterns and finding themes at 8, 10, 12 people, then hypothetically we wouldn't need 
40, 50, 100. It's kind of that, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Law of diminishing returns. The amount of time it would take to run those studies, analyze those studies, and all of that compared to getting great information, again, from 8 to 12 people from each bucket, however you define a bucket. That's why the research we did last year, the really big one, had we met 71 people. They had six buckets. Six buckets times 8 to, to 12 of each. So uh, the, the most recent one was four buckets. We were shooting for eight to 12. We had a lot of no-shows. We ended up meeting 27, so it was pretty close. Um, so uh, I can only just tell people it's law of diminishing returns and that it's good to follow best practices there. It's not like a survey where we need to see a thousand people responding. Surveys are often garbage anyway, so congratulations on your thousand garbage responses. Kayleen says, it's funny, there were a few things in interviews I thought were interesting, but there ended up being more things I wish I had chased, and then things I chased and ended up being useless. Yeah, well, again, it was like your first or second time doing this, so it's okay to make the newbie mistakes while you're an apprentice. Shalene says, I watched first four season and then stopped. This was long back. Oh, I must have missed something. What are they? V vampire show? I don't know. I missed something here. Okay. Solomon says, so, don't write everything being said if you're recording the session. Take notes of observations as they relate to your research objectives. Yeah, because remember, I like to take a couple of notes of things I'm seeing as I'm seeing them, either because I want to ask a follow-up question about them later. Remember, you don't want to interrupt the people doing the task to be like, wait a minute, what'd you do that for? You're so weird. So sometimes you want to take that note while they're doing it so you can ask a follow-up question. You know, hey, I saw you pull out that calculator earlier. Tell me more about that. Um... Or sometimes just to remember that I saw a thing. I saw something. Because again, it's not going to show up in the transcript. And um, so yeah, if you've got recording and transcripts, you don't have to write down everything being said. I do sometimes like to write a little note to myself with a few exact words that people said and the word quote. So I can remi remind myself to go digging in the transcript for this cool quote that they said. Now again, if you're, if you're gonna read through all of the transcripts anyway and go back through them or watch all of your videos again, hopefully that quote will still sound good later and you don't have to do that. But sometimes if I know I have, uh, I'm a little pressed for time on this and I'm not going to go back and listen to all 25 hours of videos, I might say, hey, find this quote, find this quote, find this quote, find this quote. And I can do that either by um, looking for a certain timestamp in the video, or I can do it by searching for a few exact words that people said, search it in the transcript, hope they were transcribed correctly. Um, but yeah, great. I would say that's a great summary, Solomon. Everybody take a look. It's on the screen. Um, I'll move out of the way. Uh, anything else? Any other questions, comments, concerns? Anything you felt like I didn't cover and we need to get into another um, show? But we've got a few more micro lessons coming this month, so hopefully um, you'll feel like you're learning more of the things. Well, if not, I hope that was helpful. How many dogs out of five would you give that one? How did, how did we do? Was that helpful? I'm always worried that these unscripted, wing it uh, micro lessons are a little weird, but I'm hoping that they are helpful. And I hope I've given people some different options to try because again, there is no one right way to do it. You can see I've evolved my own technique over time and it'll evolve again as I find more ways to be um, efficient while making sure I am hitting those research goals and getting great quotes and clips and other things. Thank you, N girl, for five dogs out of five. Thank you. Shalene says, five cute doggies. Um, Aitan says she has a question, so we'll wait for that. SR says, I've worked on projects where they wanted a survey to assess needs. For new projects, this can result in a lot of bias. Seems they are a default for non-UXers and people underestimate qualitative research. Yes, that's very true. 
Um, that is, un I'm pointing at something that's not there, sorry. That is very true. Um, and uh, the problem is that because they're so used to marketing surveys, they think, well, if we just want to know what people think or what they need, just send out a survey. Just ask people, hey, what can we improve? And of course, how the heck are you going to make sense of that later? Let's say 500 people respond to that. What are you going to do? Make a word cloud and hope that you got the right sentiment and the right facts. You're going to read all 500 things and, and do coding and tagging and analysis of it. And then what about the bias of who decided to take the survey and who gave the middle finger to your survey and didn't take it. So surveys are a bit tough. The problem is that they're so cheap and they can be so fast to run, um, not thinking about the speed or accuracy of the analysis or the quality of the questions, that many companies think just run surveys. And, and I hope that companies will learn that there's a time for surveys and there's a time for how many people feel X about Y and there's a time for us to fill in the blanks with the what's and the why's and the hows and the whos, tools, knowledge, workarounds, issues, blockers, um, and things like that. Um, so let's see, Madalena says, to practice coding, would you recommend taking transcripts of random interviews and tag them? That's part of why we did the eight transcript, the, the eight interviews on the channel. Um, so technically, you could go back and watch those eight interviews. They're there for you to practice note-taking. Um, you, you could probably use like a YouTube downloader website just in a private browser because they're scammy, but you could do a YouTube um, downloading website thing and you could grab the audio, you could dump it into a transcript thing and you could try some coding and tagging. So we did eight of those there so you can all practice your uh, note taking and coding and tagging. So those are in the micro lessons playlist. Aitan says, so does the way you code data in an affinity diagram, change depending upon what deliverables you're planning to present, like for personas, different codes, for workflows, different and so on. And thanks for waiting for my question. Um, I don't think so. I think the what would influence my coding and tagging and note taking and things like that the most are the themes and patterns that I'm hearing. Um, I think that would, that would affect things because that's going to affect the personas. That's going to affect my report. That's going to affect my typologies. That's going to affect my task analysis. So I wouldn't want to try to reverse engineer it and say, well, I think I'm going to have a persona that's kind of about this. Let's see if I can find that tag. I think that's a little bit of tail wagging dog. I would rather say, wow, you know, we really found a lot of people that, that, really didn't understand how to make the best keywords to list their item online. So that is a thing. People are confused about what are the best keywords for their online item listing, rather than to say, well, I think we're going to have a persona like this, so let's make sure that we've got a tag that's like this. Um, I, I wouldn't want to do that. And also, I don't make personas for every project. And so it doesn't make sense to say, ooh, I think I might have a persona, so let's see if I can back it into this thing. Some of the worst personas out there are just over-templatized, over-frameworked. And, and they just say, oh, well, you know, so I would say no. Just I'm just going to give you a no. I would say let the information and your good natural sense of detective hat and deductive reasoning, logic, and critical thinking find the patterns, find the uh, themes, find what people seem to have in common or, or what's going on here. Um, Solomon says, do not do personas for the sake of personas. Kayleen says, I learned the most when I just did a research report. Messed it up, but these UXR podcast episodes started to make a lot more sense. Right. Um, Vazia, I don't know if I'm pronouncing you correctly. I am bad with um, those that uh, names, just in general. Could it be an idea for a micro lesson, the process of creating a research plan and good practices? We, al we already did it. Please, everybody, go back to the micro lessons playlist. We did this. Um, 
SR, do you think designers can do good research or do you see a collaboration with researchers, a better idea on projects? Companies want an all-in-one role, research is huge in itself. Yeah, so what I said on the uh, the reaction stream on Friday was that there are some people, to me, I want to play to people's strengths. If people are excellent at uh, architecture and interaction design, I want them doing that. If people are excellent at research, I want them doing that. Um, am I against someone who does both? Well, definitely not. That's me. So I'm not a self-loathing research and architecture uh, person. But as I point out in episode 116, everybody knows you have to drink if I say episode 116. The problem with trying to have this long um, kind of arc of user-centered design done as much as possible by one person means we're moving further and further away from what our teammates see as agile. Remember that in many cases, your agile teammates built an engineering team with what, six, eight, ten uh, developers and QA testers all running at stuff and sharing tasks and and swarming on stuff and pair programming and and making little assembly lines and and boom, boom, boom. And we call it agile. And the problem is that when you have a project and Debbie's going to do all the research, we're waiting for that. Now Debbie's going to do all the design, we're waiting for that. It's moving away from what we think of as agile. And it's part of the reason why you keep hearing, well, UX isn't agile. You guys want like six months to do something. You're so waterfall. But in episode 116, I talk about, well, what if we built a team like engineers build their teams? What if we had a team where we had three researchers and two information architect interaction designers working as this little assembly line pairs, you know, feeding each other and researchers keep going and feeding the designers and designers need something tested. The researchers come back. And I think that would be more efficient. I think it would be faster. And I think it would fit into what our, our company thinks of as agile. And I think it would be a better match. Um, so, um, there you go. So let's see. Mm, Madalena says cough, cough, every single boot camp. Vazia says I'm pronouncing her name. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it's either Vazia or Vazia. I'm going to need some help with that. I guess I would guess Vazia, but I don't know. Kayleen says, big design up front. Well, as I mentioned in episode 115, big design up front is just a grumpy name that other people have given to our work when our work is done well and thoroughly. There's no reason to give our work a grumpy name for when it's done right, other than really great CX and UX. Don't call it big design up front. I like to call it important design done at the right place in the assembly line to feed engineering. So see episodes 115 and 116 about that. So we are over time by about seven minutes, but thanks to everybody for staying a little bit late and asking some great questions during this um, micro lesson. Remember, we'll be having more of these micro lessons throughout the month, mostly about research and how I personally tend to do research. So again, this is just one person's opinion. This is certainly not the only way or the right way, but if there's anything you like about my style, I hope you'll give it a try and see if it works for you. If so, so keep it and improve upon it. And if not, throw it away and try somebody else's style. So I'll play us out of here, but everybody be well, wear six masks with an extra filter, and I will catch everybody very soon. Thanks everybody for joining in. Thanks, Abby, Madeleine, Madalena, Kayleen, all the names I'm seeing over in the chat room, which is a column on the side of my screen. Thanks everybody, and uh, see you hopefully tomorrow for office hours. Customer centricity as business intelligence. Visit deltacx.com to learn why we are 